Take it away, Tom. Okay, hi folks. Uh, hopefully you can uh, see my screen. Yep. Start presentation mode, there we go. Um, Okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about Sprimzy, which is about running um, Apache Kafka on Kubernetes uh, and OpenShift. So uh, if anyone doesn't know what Apache Kafka is, it's basically a highly scalable um, uh, messaging system. Uh, it's uh, come out of LinkedIn quite a few years ago now, um, and uh, it's obviously being a messaging system. Um, it is uh, quite stateful, um, and for that reason, it's uh, something which is quite well suited to using operators. So the Strimsy project is about making uh, that as simple as possible, so that you can just uh, use Kafka uh, in Kubernetes and OpenShift without having to um, necessarily know all the operational details. So obviously, the operators sort of embed some of that logic. So we've actually got two operators in Strimsy at the moment. We've got the first one is called the cluster operator. Um, and what that does, it takes a, a custom resource which represents the Kafka cluster. Um, and it will deploy a corresponding uh, Kafka cluster and a Zookeeper cluster because Apache Kafka relies on having a Zookeeper cluster available to it. So obviously this cluster operator is responsible for managing the scaling and rolling updates and everything to do with the, um, the Kafka cluster running inside Kubernetes. Uh, so the managed resources that the sort of operator is responsible for um, are a, a stateful set each for Zookeeper and Kafka. Um, and then we've got some services in order for the um, clusters, the Zookeeper cluster and the Kafka cluster to uh, communicate amongst themselves and also to provide client access to the Kafka cluster and for uh, Kafka to access Zookeeper. We need persistent volume claims because, as I said, these things are stateful. So in particular for Zookeeper, it's important that um, if a pod gets restarted, it has access to the same data that it had before because it won't be uh, able to recover that from um, uh, the rest of the Zookeeper nodes in the Zookeeper cluster. Uh, for Kafka, it's not quite that bad um, because uh, Kafka's built-in replication is able to recover, but it can take quite a long time. So it's worthwhile using a, a persistent volume claim in order to minimize the amount of time it spends uh, fetching information from the, uh, the rest of the cluster. Um, so the the other operator we've got is what we call the topic operator. So once you've got this um, Kafka cluster running inside Kubernetes, uh, the next thing you want to obviously do as a user is you want to start um, using it and you will want to be able to deploy your um, Kafka applications um, inside Kubernetes in order to use it. And it was kind of nice if as part of that same deployment, you can have a uh, custom resource representing a, a topic within Kafka uh, so that you can deploy your topic and configure it at the same time as you're deploying the rest of your application without having to have sort of extra manual steps or extra scripting um, in order to set up the, uh, the topics that your application needs. So that's the sort of the rationale behind the cluster operator. Um, and uh, this is all sort of well and good, but there's a, a bit of a, a problem. Um, which I'll get on to in a minute. Hang on, I'll just talk about this slide first. So this is what our custom resource uh, looks like. Um, we started off using uh, config maps actually to represent the, the topics, and sort of identifying them with a, a label uh, so that we knew which config maps represented um, Kafka topics. Um, and this is now the sort of the custom resource direction which we're now going in, um, which I've been working on this last week. Uh, so as you can see, a uh, topic is sort of relatively simple thing. Um, there's got, got built-in partitioning, so we have to say the number of partitions in our topic. And we also get to say the number of replicas in our topic. Um, and there's uh, a bunch of different configuration options. So there's about a, a dozen or so different uh, topics configs that you can set there. So that's what a, a, the topics custom resource looks like. 
Well, the problem that we've got is that um, in Kafka, there's a, an API for um, creating topics, so applications can create topics themselves. Um, and also, there's depending on how the broker is configured, if you try and consume from or produce to a topic that doesn't exist, it will get created automatically for you, which means the scope for things to get out of sync. We can end up creating topics in Kafka, which then there is no corresponding uh, resource for in Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, so that's sort of something that sort of um, gets in the way of this sort of otherwise quite nice concept of being able to use a uh, custom resource uh, cap. So we wanted to make the sort of the synchronization work properly, um, which meant that we would have to create topics uh, when uh, topics were created in, in Kafka, we'd have to create them in Kubernetes or OpenShift. So, uh, we ended up having to contemplate having a, a topic operator that would synchronize the topic information in both directions, so it would be bidirectional, in other words. Um, but if it's going to be bidirectional, we have to consider uh, what's going to happen uh, if the two ends change the, the same topic at the same time. So on the left here, we've got a topic uh, as it might exist uh, as a custom resource inside Kubernetes. Uh, and someone might change something there, and at the same time, uh, something might get changed on the Kafka side, and we don't want the state to get all out of kilter um, and end up with uh, a mess where the, uh, the resource in Kubernetes doesn't ac accurately reflect the topic in Kafka. So you might think that the chances of that are pretty small, but the window is probably bigger than you at first realize because we've got to consider that the topic operator might not always be running. If it crashes and restarts, um, then the window will be as big as the um, uh, the time that it's down. And if it gets undeployed and then later redeployed, then again, the window could be quite a lot bigger. Um, so to do it properly, we've got to deal with the, this, this inconvenient fact that uh, both ends can change at the same time. But if you think about it, if the uh, operator starts up and it sees the state on the left and the state on the right here, it can't tell what's changed. It doesn't see uh, the things which I've highlighted in bold. It just sees, uh, you know, some set of properties and some other set of properties, and it can't tell which end has changed since it last uh, tried to reconcile. So to solve that, we use a, a three-way diff, basically. We have a, our own copy of the topic state, which we treat as the, the source of truth. Uh, and whenever we reconcile the custom resource, we compare it uh, with that um, private uh, copy, that private state. And likewise, when we're looking at the, uh, the topic in Kafka, we compare it with our private state. And from that, we can, can figure out sort of how that end uh, has changed. So how the, the Kubernetes resource has changed or the Kafka topic. And then we can um, check, first of all, that uh, they've not changed incompatibly uh, in the same place. So if the number of partitions, for instance, has been increased uh, to a different number on each side, then obviously that's an incompatible change. Um, and in order to deal with that, we have to apply some sort of uh, policy over which side should be the winner. Um, but if those two uh, differences uh, are not, uh, are disjoint, so um, they have an empty intersection, then we can construct the union of those two differences and apply that to both sides, and that will um, reconcile the changes which happened at both sides. So in this case, the union looks like this. Uh, the number of partitions is changed to 18, and this uh, config property has changed to that. Um, and in that way, uh, both sides end up having the same state. So. Uh, Obviously, this is not the normal way that you would write an operator. An operator is normally sort of first thing to say, really, is that you only want to make your operator bidirectional if you absolutely have to, because uh, it does uh, increase the logic rather a lot. Um, and obviously, the simpler your operator is, the uh, the more likely it is to actually work properly. Um, another consequence of this is it makes the operator stateful, whereas a normal unidirectional operator is um, pretty much stateless. It's just uh, consuming the resource on the Kubernetes side and then trying to make uh, other resources match that. Um, so with it being stateful, we have to worry about um, the availability of that um, persistent state. 
Uh, so for us, it made sense to use Zookeeper because it's uh, required by Apache Kafka anyway. Um, and therefore, if Zookeeper is not available, we wouldn't be able to reconcile the topic. Um, but if you were having to contemplate something uh, like this yourself, then you would have to have some highly available uh, persistent store available to you to be able to do that properly. And finally, uh, this sort of middle bullet point here is um, you always want to make sure that you update your private um, store of date uh, last so that if uh, your operator happened to crash um, before that gets uh, updated, but you've updated one or the other side, then when your operator restarts, it would uh, correctly synchronize the state again. So uh, that's the end of the slides. I'm hoping to do a demo as well now. Um, so I've already got the cluster operator is up and running. Um, so you can see we've got a bunch of uh, different pods going on there. So we've got the cluster operator itself at the bottom here, and we've got a cluster of uh, three Zookeeper nodes and three Kafka nodes. And I've also got um, a, uh, so in the slides, I've shown you the, uh, the custom resource version of the um, topic that I've been working on this week. Unfortunately, I was hoping to get that, although I was hoping to get that working for this demo, um, I've not quite been able to get it working in time. So uh, I'm going to be showing you a version uh, that's based using config maps to represent the, uh, the topic. So you can see here, Uh, we've got the the same sort of data that we had in the slides here. So we've got some number of partitions and some number of replicas and some config. Um, and likewise, if I've got it back in my history, I can uh, that is running um, in the Kafka cluster. Uh, we've got that same topic uh, and if you've got the five and the number of bytes in the segment ends in a seven here, uh, and they're different. It ends uh, ends with 30 and 02. So I, what I've done is I've prepared it already so that um, both ends are slightly different. And the topic operator, as we saw when I got the pods, isn't running yet. So I'll now start the topic operator, and hopefully we'll see that both sides uh, match up. So just so that you know, so um, it was the this one, which changed on the Kafka side, it was the segment bytes. Uh, and on the Kubernetes side, it was the retention milliseconds, which I can now say OC edit. Uh, my cluster. You'll see this is the uh, custom resource that we're using to represent the Kafka the cluster itself. At the moment, this doesn't include. Uh, set that to use the empty object, which means it will use the defaults which are right for what we're trying to do here. So this, when I save this, it will uh, create the uh, the topic operator inside that cluster. See it? Yeah. So it's uh, started up there, but it's not yet uh, not yet ready. Wait for that to become ready. Now, hopefully, I can. Get the one side, which is showing the five, and get the other end, the YAML, which is showing ending in 30. So it's reconciled both ends when it started up. Uh, so I think that's uh, pretty much all I've got to show you. Has anyone got any questions? I have a question. This is Diane Fadama. I was just wondering how you deal with race conditions if uh, topics are being created and deleted. Is there so? How do you create a critical region? I'm just curious about the the in Kubernetes. How do you avoid that race condition? Um. So uh, that's not something which the operator actually deals with right now. Um, so I must admit I've not put a lot of thought uh, into that. Uh, I mean, obviously uh, you're unlikely to have uh, the situation that 
you're going to have the same topic created and deleted indefinitely. Um, will eventually either end in one state or the other and the operator should deal with that but uh, in the meantime I imagine it would uh, keep going but I must admit that's not something I've thought through fully yet. Okay just curious wanted to know how that sort of thing is handled in Kubernetes or how you know the mechanism at this level um, since you're not down in the operating system you're up higher than that so yeah, I mean, certainly in the in the cluster operator, we use a, a locking strategy so that we only are processing um, the cluster sort of, um, you know, with one thread at any one time, basically. Um, so although you can have multiple um, clusters all sort of being reconciled simultaneously, there's only one which is uh, being operated on. Um, sorry, although you can have multiple being uh, reconciled simultaneously there's only one thread which is operating on any particular cluster uh, so uh, yeah okay all right thanks and then and then if you sort of synchronously wait for the resource at the other end to reconcile then um, yeah that would uh, stop you from sort of trying to reconcile at the same time that you were sort of already reconciling yeah I was just recognizing that this three-way diff could be a tricky situation in some cases. Are there any other questions for Tom? Everybody just digesting that one. Really just digesting. I was going to pose a question to the group just around, does anybody else have a need in an operator or can think of a situation where you want to have this kind of bi-directional um, traffic moving where, you know, you're going to use some uh, like the Kubernetes APIs would create a CRD that might drive something in the operator, but then also have to consume things that would uh, create resources of that same type from a different API. Um, yeah, I have a use case like that. Um, we're going to be building an operator to work against Keycloak, which is an authentication uh, server. We want to allow the developers to define which which realms and users and clients they want to consume in their application. And have the operator set those up and drop them into secrets for that for that user for that user to consume. Um, so they could potentially log into that key cloak and change something about one of those things that then would mean that the secret would be out of sync, for instance. So that's probably another situation where you could have this sort of two-way sync. We're we are kind of going a simpler route where we're saying that Kubernetes is the system of record if you're going to use the operator and basically always sync from there. So if they make the change, um, it'll get removed and replaced, um, but obviously documented. Yeah, yeah. If, if you are in the position to say that, um, you know, the, the Kubernetes is the way and the only way to do it, then that's definitely the way to go because uh, it's much easier to have a policy like that. Um, we couldn't because of, um, Kafka streams, for instance, the way it uh, creates uh, topics um, dynamically uh, just meant that we, we can't sort of turn around to people and say, oh, well, you shouldn't be using uh, Kafka, Kafka streams because that's, you know, one of the main sort of selling points of Kafka. So, um, yeah, we felt that we couldn't really take that approach. Anything yeah, I guess else? The, the previous question of um, just when you can use Kubernetes as your um, data source of truth, then you get all the atomic operations that you get from the Kubernetes API, which really, you know, are the etcd primitives that are being pulled through. So you can do like those compare and swaps and like, you know, uh, only have one person operating on an object at a time, um, which is pretty nice. I had a quick question. Uh, I think I just heard this. So the Topic or stream resources do provide all the information to access it. Is that correct? Like a secret credentials, et cetera? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what you're asking, Chance. Does does the does the topic or stream resource uh, provide all of the necessary information for connecting to said topic or stream? Or would that be also in the maybe the uh, I guess, yeah, does it, so, does there, is there like other information that would also be needed to retrieve basically? Are you sort of asking, is this sort of more about like um, having a status section in the CRD for instance, so that you can usually consume the resource um, from something which depends on reading it? 
right? Like if I, this is based on the topic in the SDK uh, mailing list that we had, which is if your resource gives me a, if it exposes a secret for connecting to it, for example, and mm -hmm. has a URL or whatever it needs to talk to it, maybe it's just the name of the service and the port, then what would be really exciting for me is being able to actually just prototype um, using your Kafka operator with my, my metering operator. And so I just wanted to know like what kind of uh, support there would be for that, if, if any. Yeah, uh, it's nothing that's uh, on the immediate roadmap, but we do want to um, add uh, support for sub, sub resources um, in our CRD uh, eventually. So you'll be able to um, scale the Kafka cluster using um, uh, the kubectl command to scale it and stuff like that. And likewise, have uh, status information so that you can easily consume uh, the endpoint from other things. I think that's what you're asking about. Yeah, basically, because what I would like yeah. to see at the long term is where if I enable the flag auto, auto connect to Kafka streams, like my operator would be able to discover these streams and create database tables that yeah. and fill the data in those tables with the content of the streams. And I actually have very specific use cases in mind for this, like, man, if that fluent D operator ever, ever ends up sending to Kafka, I could start analyzing these logs. Um, uh, and that would be, I think, a niche extremely uh, interesting use case for certain things. So it's just exciting to see where these could kind of interop. Yeah, no, we definitely want to, to get to, I mean, that's sort of one of the benefits of having the um, topic resource is it sort of makes it all sort of much more Kubernetes native. Um, and then, you know, obviously sort of other software such as uh, your own is able to consume these resources as well and uh, discover them. So yeah, that's uh, definitely, um, one of the benefits of this approach. 